O que acende a sua vontade de começar algo? Tem uma faísca em você que te chama para empreender, investir, dar novos rumos para sua vida. E para todos os seus começos, você pode contar com Santander Select. Um banco mais pessoal, mais próximo, mais humano. Um time de especialistas com olhar atento para cada momento da sua vida. Porque você sabe, só quem já deu muitos passos está pronto para continuar começando. Santander Select. Começa em você, começa agora. O que eles Wolf of Wall Street again? Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. I'm Derek Sparks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. What is up, bosses? Episode 300. We made it! 300 Invest Like a Boss. And all three of us are on the show. I got Sam and Johnny. I don't know who to start with. Sam, why don't you say where you are just really quick? I know we said we're not going to do this anymore, <laughs> but it's kind of important because yeah. I'm recording this at 10 o'clock at night. What time is it there for you? I just say it's... Uh... 12 noon my time but on a different day we're we're, little, we're like time traveling <laughs> podcasting here <laughs> yeah, yeah and johnny i think just woke up yeah i actually wanted to have that whiskey that was recommended on the last uh, episode but <laughs> i'm having a little coffee and said canadian club you mean <laughs> no no i bought the good stuff oh you did Man. oh okay i yeah, thought you were yeah. gonna break out the canadian club i broke out a uh june shine hard kombucha shout out oh, june shine that's, that's nice. good i had such a good laugh on that whiskey episode that you guys that we published like a couple of weeks ago when I was listening to it and Johnny's talking about his like 1873 Canadian club. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I don't think that was the year I, it was actually bottled. Johnny. I was cracking <laughs> up, man. That was hilarious. We've had some very good times on this podcast. I cannot believe it's already been 300 episodes. That's insane. Yeah. And eight years also. That's, I always like every year I'm like, Johnny, Derek, you, you know how long we've been doing this for? And Johnny will always be like, uh, yeah, five years or something. I'm like, dude, it's almost a decade already. That's insane. Well, we definitely mm -hmm. wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for, first off, our sponsors and our Patreons. So thank all of you guys. Yes, thank but you. But then also, Derek, you saved us. I think around episode 200, we were like, me and Sam were burnt out. We are like, man, we can't handle this workload anymore. No, I think it was like episode 100. I think I came in right down there. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Bro, uh, pat yourself on the back there, Derek. Dude, oh, thank well, you, Derek. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> It was, it was weird timing if we're going back in history here. So I've been doing the show just over four years. The first wow. week I started was the first week of lockdown of COVID. I was like, uh, are we still doing this thing, guys? Because <laughs> no one really knew what was going on. It was like, like mm -hmm. literally that first day. I think the first or second day I started was the day in LA, at least. They announced everything was just locked up. And I was just like, I don't know what's going on. But I mean, I guess I could do everything remotely. <laughs> so we can still do well, this. But, yeah. If anything, that was the perfect timing to start because first, everybody was home. So you had plenty of free time. Everyone was listening to podcasts. Yep. But secondly, it was so unknown. I remember the first, you know, four years that Sam and I were doing it, we were, our biggest complaint was everything just kept going up and there was no excitement in the market. Yeah. And then the, the market just like dropped in half. <laughs> Obviously recovered quickly, but kind of a crazy time, like exciting, but also scary. <laughs> yeah. I think the first three, the first three years, like Johnny and and myself, the number one thing we complained about was Lending Club. <laughs> mm -hmm. was like, what was the other one? Dollar, like do there was another loan site too that you guys always reference. I remember listening to the first few episodes, and I was I like, maybe Dollar Dollar Club Dollar Shape. No, I don't know. But <laughs> I should look Sam, that up. actually, this would be a good good uh, time to kind of rewind all the way in the beginning for people who don't remember. How did we start and kind of uh, where were you personally like in your finance journey uh, when we started? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, also thanks to you, Johnny, because you know without without you, of course, this wouldn't have started. There was going back, it must have been 2015, when, at least when we started talking about it. You introduced me to podcasting. We had a, a blast on your, I'm not sure if you're, still, if you're still running it, but your old Travel Like a Boss podcast. And we had a blast talking about that. And on that day, we started also discussing like investing. And we were both in a similar spot on the on the journey of trying to understand it. I think we both ended up reading Money Master the Game around the same point. We're like, dude, we gotta we gotta dive into this deeper. 
and uh, I'm very happy we did. But that's really how it all started. We like we realized, you know, if you want to be happy in life, you need to definitely understand and, and mm-hmm. master two things: finances and and your mind and and your you know your your mental state. I was actually just making a note, Sam, that I'm going to post it for the listeners too. If, so if you're listening to this, I'm going to find Sam's appearance on Travel Like a Boss because I would like to actually hear that, what you guys were talking about uh, before iLab was even created. So I'll put that in the show notes for everybody. <laughs> oh man, that'll be funny. Yeah, so that, that was pretty much how it started. Johnny and I had a couple of different investments at the same time. We're both very interested in each other's investments and we thought that would just make great content for a, a podcast. Well, you guys can definitely uh, also listen to the first few episodes um, of Invest Like a Boss where, where Sam kind of dove into his journey. But we were definitely in a very similar position kind of uh, knowledge-wise when it came to investing, but financially, we were in a very different place. Sam had just sold his company for you know, multi-millions. I was, you know, uh, I had just became a Thai bot millionaire. So, you know, my, <laughs> <laughs> my, Do my, the my... conversion rate for everybody listening, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let's say in the uh, $30,000 to $50,000 range. Uh, but I was, you know, right. really excited to start investing. And when... S- I, you know, at first, I actually didn't think Sam wanted to start a podcast with me. I thought he just wanted advice on how to start one on his own. I, th- I think his big motive was to have an excuse to talk to you know the, the brightest minds in the investing world, ask them all the questions. And I actually, Sam, maybe you can answer this question after 300 episodes. Was it in your mind from you know from the start to to co-host this podcast with me, or were you just like, you know what, this seems like way too much trouble on the back end? Johnny really knows how to do it. Let's just do it together. Yeah, I think it was always like 80% do it with you. I, I mean, I remember putting out the email to you like, Johnny, I, you know, I think this was a good idea, a good format. Also, the point that you just brought up that we were starting on the same journey, but at different wealth levels. And that seemed very appealing to capture a broader audience of like, hey, it doesn't matter where you're at. Like, we're going to look at investing at different wealth levels. I remember putting the email out to you. I was like, hey, man, like, I would love to do this with you if you want to do it here's how we can do it. Like I'll do most of the interviews. You can just kind of support with commentary and, and advice. And if you don't want to do it, like I'll do it by myself. It'd still be good to like, you know, tap into your knowledge and yeah, you pretty quickly were like, yeah, let's do it. So I, I thought we would probably get to like 50 episodes, you know? So I'm very happy that we're, we're still running it, but I think even if we had stopped at 50, it would have been definitely well worth the endeavor. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think especially those first 50 episodes, we learned so much personally for our financial journeys we'll get more into it in the the one hour uh patreon only special where we're going to deep dive into all of our finances and kind of really open up the books with screen shares and everything mm-hmm. but for this public portion we're going to answer a lot of the the patreon questions we're going to go into kind of more the, the 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 fun stuff but yeah there's definitely some some deep dives we're going to go into so thank you all of you who are Patreon supporters, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have made it to 300. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, if you guys stop supporting, it's going to be very, very, very hard to get to 400. So if you guys can step up the the, the plans from the $5 plan, or if you guys can just uh, step into the $5 plan, we'd appreciate that. Most definitely. Do you want to jump into the questions right away? Should we just get into it? Yeah, it'd be fun. All right, I can read them off. Um, let's start with Ilya on Patreon. This is a question that can apply to all three of us. Uh, what is your view on luxury watches? I believe none of you have one in your collection. I know one of us has one for sure. Since they hold the value, at least a Rolex or a Patek, it's tempting to get one for the first reason to flex, the second reason to stand out at business conference events, which could potentially lead to more networking opportunities. And Ilya also says the only thing is the value hold is also a bit artificial. I believe it's purely due to the fact that there's years of waiting lines at official dealers. So people go to secondary markets to get one and it drives up prices. Sam, I know you have at least one very nice watch that you tried to pawn off on me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't quite what I wanted, but it is a dope watch. Uh, why don't you start with this, Sam? Uh, I think if you have the disposable income and you're already investing and you know smart with your money, if you're in the business world and you want and you're going to a lot of networking events, you're doing a lot of entertaining or you know, dinners, uh, I, I think it's not a bad idea. I've got two. I've got an AP and a Breitling. I literally never wear them. I've wore the AP probably six times. In some places of the world, it just doesn't even make sense to have like to have a nice watch like Barcelona. You're literally 99 to 100% going to get targeted. LA um, too. Same thing. 
Yeah, it just it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense. So I just keep it in a safe. If you're in a, in like you know a city where you don't have that type of issue and you're in the you're in the biz, you know, in terms of resale, I know I know like on my AP the value's doubled, but in terms of how to sell that, I don't know. Like I've actually asked Derek about it, see if he wanted to pick one up. But yeah, personal personal preference. I have no intention to wear my watches again, so I'll probably just hold them until down the road either i give them to a family member a friend or or try to sell it well derek's a good friend <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, got a, he's got a silver he's got a silver ap i love the ap's i really want a gold one though but damn the gold ones are like three times the price yeah. <laughs> imagine i give it to derek and he's like yeah like it's not my first choice but yeah i'll take it <laughs> <laughs> and so, then it gets ripped off my arm as i'm walking yeah. through venice beach so. <laughs> yeah uh-huh. speaking of gold watches i really wanted a gold Rolex uh, for my celebration of you know hitting milestones. So at first, actually, I was gonna get one at my Thai millionaire's uh, status, and until I realized that that's literally thirty thousand dollars <laughs> for the gold all your one. money. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah. not even real gold. It's just go- it's just gold plated, anyways. Uh, the the starting price is on a silver you know Rolex like eight or nine thousand. So I thought, yeah, you know, maybe I'll get that. But luckily, with this podcast, I realized spending a third of your net worth on a, on something that gets stolen <laughs> off your wrist, it's a terrible investment. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's the main reason I, I never bought one. I did think again when I hit a million uh, the first time uh, before I, I lost all of it. Uh, <laughs> we'll go into that a little bit later. But I did think about getting the gold Rolex X. I'm like, you know what? Thirty thousand uh, dollars. It's you know three percent. What three percent of a million? I can I can do that now. I can justify that as a milestone, but. By that point, I just I just didn't care. For certain business conferences, I do understand that it does get you in the boys' club. I've seen it, but in general, I think most people don't care that much. And ironically, now I've I have picked up a watch that was I think two hundred fifty dollars that's gotten me more compliments and more mm-hmm. people talking to me who actually are wearing these you know uh, APs mm-hmm. and Rolexes or are actually in the watch game and it's my Omega swatch. It's the those are those are cool. Yeah. <laughs> so that's I kind of want to bring that up too because I I'm around like a lot of the car guys and they're also like watch watch guys. So it's just it's kind of the same thing except a lot easier Mm. to store and hide from your wife about how much you spent Mm. (laughs) um they they appreciate you know an an ap or a patek or whatever it might be but the watches that they really like are the the weird ones you don't ever see or something like super unique that might have been 500 dollars, but it's a watch that they've never seen it's like a guy rolling up in a brand new ferrari or lamborghini it's like your first thought is probably you're a douchebag but you see a guy (laughs) rolling up in like a 68 mustang or something you're like that guy's pretty cool i want to talk to that that guy, yeah. even though the car's yeah. a quarter of the price, kind of the same yeah. thing, you know, it's like, it's a flex, but it's, it's, you're kind of like looked at as like a douche now, <laughs> but you know what? I mean, un- unfortunately, sometimes in the, in the business world that the people on the top with the, with the most money and connections are kind of in that douche club. Uh, so whether it's having a Lamborghini, uh, you know, a La Ferrari or something, you do get th- those connections, uh, and that you're not going to get with a you know i mean i mean the mustang is a cool car but i would say the the swatch um omega swatch it's probably like the miata the mx5 of (laughs) of sports cars you know anyone who's actually into cars they respect it because they're like man that's a very fun cool you know car but it's not that expensive all right should we move on ap speaking of ap there's the (laughs) next guy is named ap but uh he has a very financial based questions we're gonna save that for the uh, patreon only so just another reason to sign up for patreon let's go to mark's question he's also on patreon he said i believe sam mostly lives in barcelona So I'd like to ask about his experiences as a tax resident there. I'm considering moving to Spain, but I always hear complaints about high taxes. I'd also like to ask Sam if he has any experience or knowledge of Valencia, since it seems to become a popular destination for expats moving to Spain. And then another person added onto this and just said, uh, Sam, they're surprised that you uh, live in Barcelona or you visit these expensive places being a wealthy digital nomad and you don't seem to take advantage of tax havens. So why don't you start with Barcelona and your experience with Spain and then why you're living there, even though it's a, a tax heavy place. Okay, I got uh, So first question, tax residency. Firstly, I don't know any expats that are living in Barcelona that are paying that really excessive tax, which Spain taxes on worldwide assets, not just worldwide income. So it's actually Oof. in a lot of ways worse than the US tax system. But I know a lot of families living there, even people that have their kids in the school system, which is like a major indicator that you're a resident there. And none of them, let's just say they're all avoiding it. 
So once you get to Spain and you kind of get in the network, you get yourself an attorney, there's there's definitely ways to, to mitigate it. it the, the clearest way is just to travel to a place like Andorra frequently or across the border to France, et cetera. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that, but you have to think a little bit down the line, like how integrated into the system are you going to be? You know, like, are you going to have a job there? Are you going to have kids in school? All these things add additional ties that they can get you for. For me, is you know, digital nomad spending six months a year, there's absolutely no issues. With regards to Barcelona, I, I've traveled almost everywhere in Spain. I don't think there's any place even comparable to Barcelona, but everyone's got their preference. Some people love Valencia. For me, it's like if Barcelona is a nine on a 10 scale, Valencia is like a four. The only reason I think you would find Valencia better is if you wanted to live in a place that's, you know, 60% the cost. It's definitely cheaper in Valencia. And uh, if you wanted more of like a, a true Spanish experience culturally. But other than that, I think Barcelona wins basically on every single level. So if you just look at like a quick map of Barcelona, you know, if you go down to Valencia, you've got a coast, you know, that's, that's the feature. If you go to Barcelona, you've got the coast, you've got world-class skiing right here in Andorra, even closer here in like Berga area, only an hour and a half away, you've got world-class skiing. You've got Costa Brava here, which is arguably one of the best coasts in all of Europe or even all of the world. And then all around here is world-class vineyards. So mm -hmm. you just have a very feature-rich area. The one thing that people get wrong with Barcelona is when people visit Barcelona and for the, for patrons, you guys will be able to see all this on video. I'm referencing stuff on maps right now on the screen, pretty much everyone comes here when they come to Barcelona. This is like Sagrada La Familia area. This is the old city in the beach area. This is mm -hmm. great for like two days, three days sightseeing, get into these old cobblestone streets and like these, you know, 300 year old buildings, old bars, tapas and stuff. But that is not a place that you want to be living or spending significant amount of time. For me, Barcelona is all about the beautiful architecture, the tree lined streets, the pedestrian ways. And all that is in this area that I've got highlighted in green. This is Champla area. This is actually where I live. I got a little house symbol here. The city's investing a lot into pedestrian ways of converting a lot of these streets into walking only. You know, Barcelona in this area is a city you want to be looking up. When you look up, you see blue sky, green trees, and some of the most beautiful architecture anywhere. Um, so that's the Barcelona experience for me. But most people, unfortunately, only know kind of this this old town like bar tourist area that just literally has nonstop tourism all year round. And it's all like bachelor and bachelorette parties and stuff. I, I go down here like once every two, three weeks, maybe for like an afternoon. That's it. So yeah, that's, that's my, that's my take on Spain and, and Barcelona as a, as a destination. Yeah. I've actually been to uh, both cities and I would agree hundred percent with, with what Sam said, uh, Valencia to like, I had heard it hyped up. And when I went, I was mm -hmm. like, why would anyone live here? It's just a, a crappier, cheaper version of Barcelona. If you wanted yeah. to live in a in a beach town that's cheaper, you might as well go all the way south to like Malaga or you know somewhere with a better beach. Yeah, Johnny, we actually went to Valencia together for like lunch. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah I remember, remember that. that. <laughs> yeah, and how, and how far didn't... apart are the two cities? Um, because they look decently close on the map. You can take a train to Val from Barcelona to Valencia in uh, three or four hours. Okay. I think I was uh, stuck in that uh, touristy area for quite a while because I remember like, like <laughs> every place was like tapas bars and like it was like busy and all the all the people on like mopeds, all yeah. the like DoorDash drivers and things like that. Mm -hmm. It was I mean, the architecture was amazing, though, like so beautiful there. I just I just didn't like the people. The people were dicks. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think that is, you know, honestly, I think that is, that's the experience definitely anywhere in Spain now with tourism. Like I was just traveling through Madrid to the west coast of, of Spain. And it was like, it's the same, man. I mean, they just have so much tourism now. I think like mm -hmm. most destinations in the world and the locals just, you know, frankly, they're a little bitter about it, I think so. But hey, we'll let Bar we'll let the Catalans of Barcelona, you know, be a little li like that because they built seriously like the most beautiful city in the world. So let them, you know, let them be who they are. They get a free pass. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about the second part of that question, Sam, when they're asking, why aren't you uh, looking at some like cheaper tax haven cities? Like, obviously, oh, man. You, you justified Barcelona and you say the price is fine. Have you ever, has it ever crossed your mind to live somewhere cheaper? Well, in terms of tax savings, 
No, um, because I'm already quite tax advantaged as a U.S. citizen because I don't have state income tax. And if I'm earning money, which I'm not, I get the foreign earned income exclusion. So personally, it's never appealed to me. You, know, you hear like these billionaires that go to live in Puerto Rico and they have to lock themselves on a small island for seven months a year. It's like, how much money is enough money? So that type of lifestyle, I think, is appealing where money is your motivation in life. And like, that's the game that you're playing. For me, it doesn't make sense at all to live any place that I don't want to live just to, to save or make a little bit more money because it's not my primary objective right now. So I, I never would consider moving somewhere for more money or for better tax savings at this point. Yeah, especially as an American, we have to pay tax to the U.S. anyways. So it doesn't really make sense mm -hmm. for us. If you are another nationality, that yeah, then definitely look into it a little bit deeper. Yeah, good point, John. Yeah, I think like, Puerto Rico is really kind of the only option for us. I'm not not doing that for, for yeah. any amount. I've seen some of the setups in Puerto Rico too. They like literally just wall off. It's like you live in your own little bubble, like because the people that move there don't want to associate with the locals at all. They just they're literally just there <laughs> to save money. It's it's kind of creepy. Yeah, you, you described my it's sister creepy. and her and her husband exactly. They live in a gated community. Uh, there, yep. they never interact with the locals. The locals hate them. Yep, <laughs> pretty wild. All right, we can all answer this next question. Uh, Ian from Patreon asks, 300 episodes is quite an accomplishment. Congratulations. Thank you, Ian. Looking forward to the next 300 episodes. Which guest was the most impactful to you personally and financially over the years? And what lessons did you learn? I can start with this one if you guys are cool with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think uh, from the perspective of like most impactful, just recently, I'm going to say Michael Foster on CEFs because be he was on what, like six months ago on iLab 262, maybe a little, actually about a year ago. And listening to that, something was just like, you know what, this makes sense. And a lot of people aren't, aren't following mm -hmm. these CEFs. And I've, I've actually had some, a lot of success with that. And I went back and listened to his, his first episode, which was episode uh, 62, which was before I even joined the show. And kind of took a lot of that and absorbed that and really dug into CEFs where there's there's guests that we have on where I'm like, that's interesting. But then there's guests that we have on where I'm like, I want to learn everything I can about that. So um, CEFs, I've really found that. Michael Foster, I thought was a great guest. He's been on twice. And then from a personal standpoint, uh, I would say Pace Morby in 271. Mm -hmm. um, not just because of all his like real estate deals and everything that he's done, but he's, always, he's kind of become a friend of sort. Um, I interviewed him for another show and he's just like been a really awesome guy. And he's like, all over social media, like blowing up and everything, but he'll take the time to like talk with you and like work things out. And he's, he's just kind of become like a mentor for me lately. So I really like Pace Morby. He's like a cool, genuine guy. Uh, those are the first two that kind of came to mind for me. Oh, nice. Very cool. I, I thought you were going to say option about the options, man. You've been, like, I'm, I'm headed, into that now too. On that. Yes. Yeah. I, I do have some, uh, I don't know if we're going to have time on this update, but I'll definitely give a Patreon update on options too, because right, that's, right. uh, that's been a thing too. <laughs> all right, Johnny, why don't you take it? Yeah, so for mine, I mean, I would say the guest that made me the most money was Bill Perkins. That was episode uh, yes. MLP 149. He just mentioned MLPs at kind of at the very end. And then I did a follow-up again on uh, episode 159. And I was like, you know what? Yeah, he sounds like a smart guy. This makes sense. Let me uh, throw... I don't, I don't I can't remember how much I, I put in. Maybe like 30, 40 grand or something. But it... It was the best investment I've ever made. Uh, if off the top of my head, that investment doubled. But at the same time, you know, who who knows that that, that was a risky investment. Um, but it definitely did make me a lot of money. Those things kind of worry me. Do you remember Johnny? Did you get K ones for those? Because that's the only thing I didn't really like about those for tax purposes. Yeah. Luckily, I have a very good accountant who she likes me, so she <laughs> lets me get away with a bunch of uh, BS. extras. Yeah, <laughs> extra. Yeah, I'm like, hey. Uh, I haven't done any accounting at all for my business last year. Can you just do it for me? <laughs> yeah, like, I yeah, I ran sure. into that with um, nice. Fundrise and my accountant got a stack and he's like, what is this? Oh, so, God, <laughs> yeah. Like Louisiana filings. Yeah. And Delaware, yeah, yeah. All these $50 filings for... Thankfully, states. he sorted it out. But yeah, that was a that was a shock to get a, a hundred plus page document. Yeah. Watch out Unfortunately, for that paperwork. I haven't become a... Friends with uh, Bill Perkins, and I haven't been hanging out with him and uh, Blizzard on his yacht or anything. But yeah. you know, it was I still, still follow fun. him. He's got a cool life. He he seems to be oh, a yeah. little more uh, settled down. I think he's got a wife now, or at least a serious girlfriend. But he still looks fun. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm sure. That's so funny. I was I was thinking about him today because on that episode, he's like, yeah, I might get out like once a year for drinks until midnight, but that's about it. I'm like, that's how I feel right now. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> but he's 10, he's 10 years senior, so I'll definitely be that way then. Sam, uh, who are the most impactful see, for you financially? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's it's hard. Okay, it's hard not to give a shout out to our, our friends over at Art of FX because that just continues to perform every single year, like clockwork. But if I think of like long term, what's been what's been like the most fundamental, what's made me actually the most money, and what I would bet on is making me money in the future is kind of like the boring 101 episodes that we've done uh, some in the early days, it's really just about like overall market theory and um, and index investing. And those like that come to mind would be Paul Merriman, episode 25, Daniel, uh, was it Dr. Daniel Crosby, episode 36. And I think a really underrated episode that I took a lot from was on behavioral finance with Betterment. I think those three episodes, just like if you can really digest all that, and apply the knowledge over the course of like a handful of years, that has got to be just like so fundamentally valuable for your whole life of investing. So I would, I would say those, um, and then on personal level, a bit of a curveball here, but this is going to be an episode that's not released yet. It'll be episode 302, uh, with K- uh, Kat M. Morton and it's on training the mind. Mm-hmm. And I've been, he's been a, basically a teacher of mine now for the last year and a half in a weekly study group. And that has been definitely the most mentally transforming experience and initiative of my life. So yeah, having the opportunity to re- even talk to him one-on-one was really an awesome experience for me. And so, yeah, look forward to that training the mind episode two, uh, 302 coming up. So for the uh, finance part, I would have bet money that you're going to mention the nu- annuities, <laughs> Stan the annuity man, yeah. <laughs> you love those. We got a question on him coming up. So glad you brought that up, Johnny. Um, why don't you yeah. remind everybody who your annuity man is, Sam? Ah, Stan the annuity man. Not Sam the annuity man. Stan the annuity man. <laughs> Does that mean you sold some, Sam? No, no. I, I have actually, at any given time, I usually have five policies through them. Yeah, the, guys, they're they're bank CDs. That's They're bank CDs, except they go through an insurance uh, company instead of a bank, and they're tax deferred. So think of getting your 5% interest but it's tax deferred. The downside is you got to lock the money up for one, three, five years, or as long as you want, really. Um, but yeah, I just keep, I just keep rolling these over. I've had them since we started the podcast. I still have them, and you get a little bit better interest. So instead of getting five percent in money market right now, you get six percent, and you can lock it in. Like I locked it in for five more years. Why not, right? Yeah. So, oh, you also mentioned. Uh, earlier, you mentioned Art of FX as being one of the, the biggest winners. It's ironic because I remember from day one, we were saying, guys, be careful. You know, th- this, this is going to be <laughs> unsecured. This might be dangerous. And yet it's been one of the the, the most kind of um, solid performing ones, you know, uh, throughout the 300 episodes, throughout the eight years. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. the really boring things <laughs> like worthy bonds or you know other stuff yeah. some of those oh, end up failing <laughs> pure street or, or, yeah, yeah worthy yeah. bonds yeah. pure street it was and, like and our, pure street our, was like... a great great company like very good yeah. company real estate back just makes sense you know and unfortunately it, it went down meanwhile two guys drinking whiskey in bangkok they, 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 they're still paying out on time <laughs> so well so well summarized Art of yeah. FX is iLab 3, and Stan the Annuity Man is iLab 4. So go back yeah, and check totally, those out. Totally different, uh, totally different uh, <laughs> paces to those episodes. One, I'm talking One, I'm talking to like a, an insurance broker in a suit and tie, like very <laughs> kind of like calmly. The next one, Johnny and I are drunk in a, in a penthouse in Bangkok. Oh, was that one? Was that? Oh, there's one you guys were drinking in a car too, like a limo or something. <laughs> oh, that was, with, that, was with Michael Fo- that was with Michael Foster. Oh, I'm was like, that? How do we make- okay. How do we make an episode on municipal bonds more entertaining? So we're like, yeah, let's get a limo and go record it in there. (laughs) Hey, bosses, we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. The show will be right back. Entrando em contato com atendimento ao cliente. Para muitas pessoas é um jeito fácil de arruinar um bom dia. Mas na Zendesk, nós deixamos a experiência do cliente melhor. Melhor para sua avó, melhor para o seu vendedor preferido de flores, melhor para o cara do apartamento 3A, melhor para você, melhor para todos. Porque enquanto alguns dizem que o cliente sempre tem razão, nós dizemos que o cliente é sempre humano. 
E, como seres humanos, queremos fazer algo melhor para todos nós. Zendesk, experiência do cliente com IA desenvolvida para humanos. Well, our next question is guest related too. So it's uh, Chris from Patreon asks, who's in your iLab Hall of Fame and who's in the iLab Hall of Shame? Uh, let's start with the Hall of Fame and then we'll get to the, the juicy Hall of Shame mm. after that. Johnny, why don't you kick this one off? Who's in your Hall of Fame of iLab guests? No, let, me, let me go last. I, actually, I, I've, been, I've been scrolling All through right. 300 episodes. Johnny didn't prepare, yeah. obviously. <laughs> I'll start. I'll start. First off, I thought of Ryan Serhant from Million Dollar Listing just yeah. for the simple fact that He was the first guest I booked on the podcast. So that was kind of cool. And he was like a big get at the time. And he's actually got a new uh, Netflix show coming out this week. So I'm excited to check that out. He just, he's like killing it. I think he sells like a billion dollars a year in real estate in New York. Oh. Um, Cody Sanchez, she was awesome. Episode 217. Just like, I see her all over social media now. And this was kind of like right when she was starting to blow up. So I was glad to get her. One of Dave Ramsey's personalities, Jade Warshaw. I also had a really good conversation with her in episode 269. Um, it actually, after that, she reached out and said, I need you to um, meet Dave uh, Ramsey. So that was like really flattering. And then that turned into... <laughs> not what I had expected, but um, the thought was nice and I did not meet Dave Ramsey. But <laughs> anyways, Jade was very cool. And then I had to give a, um, those are people that I've interviewed that really I, I kind of thought of. And then I have to give a shout out to Omar Khan. He's just a, he's just a, a great guest. He's been on multiple yeah. times, 125, 209 from Boardwalk Wealth. One I didn't expect to like, and I really, I liked the the guests more than the investment was uh, Safety and Amus uh, talking about Bitcoin. That guy oh, just, yeah. just seemed like next level smart. And um, everything that he said would happen basically did happen. So that was interesting. That was episode 218. And then the last one was also one of the, the first guests I booked. Um, just because I'm a huge football fan, I thought it was awesome to talk to Drew Bledsoe. Um, episode oh, 168. Yeah. He was really great. And he actually, he just appeared on the Tom Brady roast a couple weeks ago. So he's kind of back in the news. Um, those were the ones Dude. that kind of first came up to mind. Man, good, good shout on those, Derek. Because we have a page on the site that's called most popular episodes, but we haven't updated it in probably since <laughs> pretty <before> old. COVID. <laughs> so like all those you just named are not on there. You like forgot all uh, about. Yeah. Go, yeah. Drew should be your back, guy. He's into wine. Drew, and yeah, <laughs> definitely, man. That was a good one. Good one. We had Bob Sapp on. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. That was right around the time I joined too. Yeah. That was cool. Jim Rogers, adventure mm -hmm. capitalist. That was super Still fun. Still haven't finished that book. <laughs> I remember the the one the, like the first two that I was like nervous for was uh, Harry Dent and mm. James Alcher. Those are good guests mm -hmm. too. Those were like yeah, these are. I mean, there's like Wealthfront CEO and Andy Rockliffe. We had Betterment CEO on Ed Conard of um, Bain Capital. Med Faber. Med Faber has got to be up there, and just in terms of like knowledge share and, and learning, and also like very cool guy. That's a good episode. Yeah, John. Any others pop for you? Yeah, I was gonna say that especially the beginning that the first hundred episodes every time we would be interviewing a ceo of one of these you know multi-million dollar companies i would get a little bit nervous uh and just mm -hmm. having access to be able to ask them the questions it, it was to me that was uh it it, it made the show kind of uh what, what it was so you know everyone you mentioned you know big names um you know and people like james altucher and um, mj d marco you know sam dogan Uh, oh, these yeah. guys, yeah, Simon yeah. Black, these good. guys that you know normally people don't have access to. It was just very cool to have them. I would say the one episode that's always been in the back of my mind that I wanted to do and I never did, but it just made sense was the Land Geek. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, he's on the treadmill. Remember he was on the he was talking on the treadmill while he was being interviewed. I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Mark Mark J. Podolsky, and that was the one episode where I played back a few times and I was like, you know what, I should get into this. And it makes sense. You know, I could see myself actually doing well with it if I actually lived in the U.S. And it'd be fun. Uh, but that's that's one thing I never got into. But I did end up meeting uh, and hearing from a few guys who did jump on it. And, and they actually did pretty well. Yeah. Nick, who we yeah. met in Ukraine, ended up doing it. Um, I follow him on social media and he's like living a boss ass life now yeah. and traveling all over because he made so much money off that. Man. And um, we actually had him on the show too. So yeah, he, he was like, great. That was actually a cool story. because he said, you know, he found out about that from iLab and it kind of yeah. changed his life. And, and that was 2017 before the big land boom of mm -hmm. uh, COVID. So imagine you bought mm -hmm. a bunch of land right before COVID and, and everybody wanted to move out to, you know, farm country yeah. or off the grid. Good point. 
Yeah, because he was buying property in the middle of nowhere, which yeah. would have been perfect in 2020. <laughs> All right, let's oh, yeah. let's talk the bad ones. Uh, Hall of Shame. <laughs> um, well, let, let, I'll start on this. So we, we okay. have to preface this a little bit. We can't really label these shame, right? No, no, no. Yeah, in my it's, opinion. It's, Maybe not. Maybe they didn't go the way you expected. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know that's not that's not the intention, but I did do like kind of a quick review of all of our episodes. I don't think any of them have come out to be like scams, which is like that would be the worst ones, right? But I definitely agree, yeah. some of them have some of them have failed, but that's inevitable. Um, and I think also in a lot of cases we weren't the the primary intention with the episode was not to look at the company but was to look at the industry try to learn something about the industry like a good example of that is like the Matterport episode that we just released yeah we're talking about Matterport but really we're we're trying to understand like merger arbitrage yeah. arbitrage uh, merger arbitrage right so with that you know we have had a few that haven't panned out and in a lot of cases we either have we lost money with those ourselves or we have money tied up. So like Pier Street, money's tied up. Black Cops, oof, that's, that one still stings. Oh, yeah. That's pretty I, fresh. I that's a pretty fresh that. wound. I mean, that was a beer company. That was another one of my like safe buckets, right? Very good food company. Mm -hmm. That was on my list, yes. But pretty much all those, like they were a small company, but all those, let's see, protein replacement companies or protein alternative companies, those have all gotten beat up really bad since COVID. Uh, MGTCI was like a Bitcoin mining company. Mm -hmm. um that was like who was God, that, that was a thing uh, in what 2017 everyone was mining bitcoin and like <laughs> yeah but how do how, how do they fail like they're in the right space and the right sector and taking advantage of the bitcoin boom but i think in all of all, all those episodes we definitely learned a lot even in on the investment sides where we may have lost money we still learned a lot what other ones stand out to you i'm, I'm sure you guys try to forget about the bad ones. I have one <laughs> that that Johnny interviewed that I just remember. I just there's something about him I didn't like. He, he might be a great guy, I don't know. But Johnny, do you remember the real asset investor Dave Zook? Mm. He did the ATMs. That was a long time ago. Yeah, like a year and a half ago. So, he he got rich basically like preying on low-income neighborhoods and installing uh -huh. like ATMs with really high fees. Okay. And I think Johnny kind of pushed him on it a little bit, like, like, and the guy got really defensive about it. And he's like, Hey, <laughs> that's their problem. And, and it was just, it just felt slimy. Uh, I was just like, Oh, I don't want to invest with this guy. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I bet you he's actually making pretty good money because now, oh, now he is. I mean, I'm yeah. saying he is. It's, I just, I just don't want to, I don't want to be associated with him. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, so Sam made a really good point where, you know, like when we interview uh, guests, it's it's about learning more about the topic. It's not necessarily a, um, you know, investment recommendation. Yeah. yeah. So that actually ties into the next question. Curtis from Boston Island Jazz, what is your, involved in your vetting process when you bring mm -hmm. guests on? Uh, there's been a lot of variance between really good information and then some scammy stuff all over the years. Uh, so, yeah, as um, Derek and Sam said, like nothing, luckily, you know, out of 300, nothing's turned out to be like a, you know, complete scam or like a, you know, pyramid scheme. When we think that it could potentially be something like that, we guys, we warn you and we're like, you know what, you know, Art of FX is two guys drinking whiskey in a, in a Bangkok penthouse. But this seems like a very cool concept to, to learn more about, you know, uh, you know, invest in your own risk. And sometimes it ends up doing really well and and on the other side you know things that seem very very uh legit that's you know fdic like you know approved or like uh or vetted you know like you know not by us but by like government institutions you know like worthy bonds i, I yeah. you know, th those end up failing or ahp servicing which is one that i had uh you know, quite a bit of money yeah. in that was a very good concept it was helping people you know who were otherwise going to lose their house you know have a second chance you know, I put money in that because I thought it was a, it was a very good um, idea, and it's real estate backed, just like Pier Street, and those end up failing. So it's uh, it's it's tough. Luckily, you know, that's way less than ten percent of the three hundred episodes uh, that we've had. And I'm willing to bet it. I, I haven't done the math on this, but I'm pretty sure if someone put a hundred bucks in every single investment that we have mentioned on this episode, they'd be up uh, by by quite a bit, even with a few that had dropped off. Yeah, I think I did a calculation of that like a like a year and a half or two years ago. We tried to do like best and worst investments or something like that. But just to speak to that as well, like, I don't know, Worthy Bonds, for example, I remember like we found out they're getting investigated by the SEC and I warned everybody on there like, hey, you should you should get rid of this if, you, if you're like, here's what's going on. Mm -hmm. 
And at that time they were accepting cash outs. And then like maybe a month later, they weren't accepting it anymore. And everyone's like, what's going on? And I'm like, well, we're telling you like there could be something here. I'm just thinking of like other guests. Like I've had people reach out to me personally. They'll message me or email me and say, hey, I found out about this investment through iLab and I'm having some troubles cashing out or they're not being transparent with me. I'm happy to reach out to these people. If you if you found out about something about iLab and, and you feel like you've been wronged, like we want to try to fix that. And I and if that is the case with you or something, like reach out to us. We'll we'll do everything we can. And, and yeah. in all those cases, I think I it's been resolved. The problem's been resolved. So it's like don't be afraid to reach out. If if you learn something from our show, like we take that personal. Like we we want to help you in any way. Absolutely. And this is why this is why it's so good that we have the community. We have the the boss lounge, which is a free community on on Facebook. Uh, people can talk about their investments and what's going on with them. And then we have the Patreon, you know, which is the 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 paid portion. But between these two, the, you always have a voice and you can, you know, talk about investments uh, with other, you know, iLab listeners, uh, both the good and the bad. So let's let's talk about just a couple before we break into a Patreon portion of this episode. I want to hear both from you guys, maybe one or two of your kind of top learnings or, or summaries over the 300 episodes. Like what's What's a narrative that goes through your mind that has been hardened into your memory bank uh, and your strategy for for investing? I, I can start with that. It's, at first, I got really excited and wanted to buy everything that we talked about. <laughs> and then um, I realized now that's probably not the best idea. And kind of going on the back one, they're like, how do you how do you vet your episodes? These days, I would say it's more for entertainment value. Who's going to be interesting that we want to talk to? There's so many financial podcasts out there that are boring and awful, and they probably do provide good information, but you're going to fall asleep at the same time. So my first kind of vet on a guest is like, are they going to be interesting? Do they have something different to say than your average? Oh, I invested in real estate and I flipped 12 houses last year. I don't mm -hmm. care about that. And and if you want to find that, there's plenty of other places to find that. So I think that's... The lesson is for me is like, it, I still want to have someone on, even if it's not an investment I'm involved in. And now I have the freedom to not invest in everything we do because it's just too much. Um, yeah, it's there's too much burden investing in a hundred different things. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I was the same way. Like the first hundred episodes, I'm pretty sure I invested in 90 of those, <laughs> those hundred <laughs> things. And it was a great learning experience. It was fun. I ended up making money from it. But tax forms, you know, logins, headaches, it, mm -hmm. it definitely wasn't something I wanted to continue. And that's why I'm glad Derek came on and kind of took that baton. Definitely. Yeah, I think in, in summary, the um, the main thing I've realized over the 300 episodes, what what I think we really did was we crammed, we crammed a lifetime of investing experience into kind of eight years. So with that, mm -hmm. for sure, we made mistakes, we, we made kind of a clutter of paperwork, tax filings, but but and we had some losses, probably more losses than we would have ordinarily taken. But I think overall, of course, we can rest on this knowledge going forward. One realization that you see all the time um, that we've been able to realize through our investments in the podcast is is really, really difficult to outperform the U.S. stock market. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go into 50 different investments and startups and crypto and everything like chances are you're still not going to outperform the U.S. stock market over 10 years, 20 years, um, but you will create yourself a lot more activity, mm -hmm. right? So you really need to decide like, what it, what are your goals? And are you an active investor or are you a passive investor? Like Derek and I have been getting into options a lot in the last couple months. That takes quite a bit of time. It's fun, but it, it takes a lot of time. You got to watch the stock markets. You got to watch the, the options quite closely. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the Patreon exclusive as we go into some, a lot of our investments and portfolios. But one other thing that ties into what we've just been talking about the last 10 minutes or so is another realization is like looking at alternative assets and a lot of the new emerging investment platforms that were really, really exciting. And, and part of the reason we wanted to start this podcast like eight years ago was all these new platforms, CrowdStreet, mm -hmm. YieldStreet, uh, worthy bonds, and the list goes on and on, like in every single country. But what we have to realize now in hindsight is that these companies are startups. So just because you're not investing $100,000 directly into that company, you're still giving a startup your money to manage. You're not giving it to Vanguard to manage. You know, mm -hmm. you're giving it to startup founders and startup founders 
while they might be smart and they might have the right intentions, they take a lot of risk, right? And they they, they strive for growth. So what we've seen in just in the last couple of years is so many of these companies have failed despite probably their right intentions because they're a startup, right? They get different investor and different shareholder groups. They have to meet quotas and hit KPIs and stuff. So you have to take a lot of caution when investing in any of these platforms um, and putting money with them because you're putting, you're trusting your money to be managed by startup founders. I didn't even think of that really. That's a very good point. So <laughs> they want to impress somebody and they want that big cash out at the end when they go public or whatever it may be. And you got that mindset and it's a lot of young people. Mm -hmm. There's nothing against young people, but they want to, they want to impress and go, and go wild when really the person you want invest or er, uh, running your funds is probably over 50. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> has some more you want experience. It to be boring. Yeah. <laughs> you want it to be slow and boring for sure. And you also see with a lot of these investment platforms, the first deals that are released on the platforms, they're like so good. They're so mm -hmm. appealing. Because they give up all their margin so that yep. they can acquire the customer, right? And then over months and years, it's like the deals become less good. The, you know, the payouts become less. And all of a sudden, it's like, this sucks. <laughs> I want to get out. Exactly. It's just like um, buying Zoom. Zoom's like doubled in price since 2020. <laughs> or like, wait, yeah. the quality still sucks. What happened here? Well, their <laughs> stock was dropping, so they got to pump it up. <laughs> hey, bosses, we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. The show will be right back. Think of some brilliant business partners, Ben and Jerry, Procter and Gamble. How about Buffett and Munger? We bring up those guys all the time. And if you're looking for the perfect partner to grow your business, that's going to be you and Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. So whether you're selling shipping supplies or promoting productivity programs, Shopify helps you sell everywhere from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. In fact, all three of us here at Invest Like a Boss have used Shopify at one point or another. Johnny actually hit me up and he said he used Shopify for his drop shipping business and made over $30,000 a month in sales. He said they're the best, easiest to use platform and it grew with his needs. So now it's time to start your Shopify story. Sign up for $1 a month when you do a trial period at shopify.com slash iLab. Make sure the iLab is all lowercase. Head to shopify.com slash iLab now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash I-L- a B. All right. Well, that takes us to our last uh, two questions. They're kind of related. Adam and Christopher, both from Patreon, uh, ask kind of related questions. Adam asks, if each one of you was a billionaire, how would your lives different from the way you're living now? I think billionaire is a bit of a stretch. We would all be in private jets and, you know, uh, flying around. But let, let's say, you know, if we were all 10 times our where we are now. Uh, and then Christopher asks, other than financial assets, what other things you would invest in? Time, mental health, material possessions? How has this changed as you evolved as people? Derek, want to go first on that? Sure. I would definitely, private jet was the first thing on my list to, to travel. Um, it's all about like taking back time, I think, at that point. Just having other people do things for you that you don't want to do so you can actually have time to enjoy your life. But I don't know how much billionaires can really enjoy their life. So I think a billion is a little too much. <laughs> um, any billionaire is like just working nonstop because they're that ambitious. So a billions might be too much because it's just you're just all focused on the money. So there's got to be a happy medium somewhere in there. Um, otherwise, I uh, I would focus definitely on buying back time and enjoying it because I feel like I have no time right now. So the only thing I really have right now where I can I prioritize over money or working is my health. Um, I'm training for my next marathon again, and that's just kind of like kickstarts me into like actually getting back into shape. I had hurt my back earlier this year for like three months. I I could barely just beyond do anything beyond walking. Anytime I lifted any kind of weight, it would just aggravate it and it, it sucked and I'm finally better. So I'm happy for that. I dropped 15 pounds. I gained like 20 pounds just from mm. not working out and wow. it really drove me crazy. So I'm, I'm almost back to my, like my fighting weight right now. So, um, yeah. <laughs> running, uh, running, I find it, um, uh, mentally healing for me. I just, I, I think about so many 
things and like zone out. I don't know if you're not a runner, you don't really get you. You really do get that runner's high thing. So mm -hmm. I enjoy that, and that's my kind of escape. Yeah, that, that's the uh, endorphins because your body's like shutting down because like you're like you know what, <laughs> like, make it stop. <laughs> We're gonna die. We're dying. So let's just uh, have this yeah. Elysium moment. Um, <laughs> but I know f for me, actually, th if you asked me, let's say f five years ago. I would have said, yeah, with a billion bucks, you know, I would buy like, you know, make a mansion, you know, yachts and you know, travel the world, you know, have a really good time. Now, actually, I would start my own private military. Oh, man. Wow. To war zone yeah. Johnny over here. Uh, yeah, Wagner group. And, yeah, but it would be the opposite. Militia where, FD. Yeah, <laughs> we would only do good things. So we would involve ourselves. It, I'd be like halfway between wagner and the un <laughs> that makes sense uh -huh. like peacekeepers you know i would be like okay what's what's going on in the world who needs help i'm gonna go help the good guys so like right now you know obviously i would help ukraine but also uh other parts of the world you know like myanmar they're trying to get rid of the you know the, the dictator there that china's back i'm like you know what i could send my you know johnny f you know the, the fd army over there and, and help out a little bit so yeah why not <laughs> that's that's an interesting take <laughs> i i didn't i didn't see that one coming johnny but i like i like what you're doing man <laughs> it's like a batman org for for good right you call it batman.org yeah. <laughs> uh, i mean because I, I think a lot of people don't realize how much a billion dollars gets you i mean you could literally spend i, I guess i haven't done the math but it's, it's something like you could spend a million dollars every you know like a, a day for like three years day. and 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 even with the interest yeah, you're probably a, still not going to run out <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, so it, it's an insane amount i mean like how many ferraris can you buy how many mansions can you buy so i would i would have to do something much bigger with that money but if i just you know let's say 10x my my net worth the only things i would really do differently uh is i would fly business class everywhere um, you know, instead of and instead of having these these stressful you know, long layovers on the on these cheap airlines, uh, I would probably only drive new cars and not have to deal with like cars breaking down all the time. Like my you know fourteen year old port you know mm -hmm. Porsche Cayenne. <laughs> I, but I don't think I would change that much. You know, like I wouldn't want to live in a big mansion. I think it's just too much upkeep and headache. Yeah, give me the nicest three thousand square foot house there is. Yeah, um, give me that. Like, you know. <laughs> And I, honestly, I don't even think I would want to buy multiple houses because there's more things to keep up, you know, and, and yeah. think about. It's like mental energy. But what I would really, really like to do is be in a position where I can stay at the Four Seasons and not blink about the cost and be able to put my friends and my family in the adjacent rooms at the Four Seasons and say, you know what, mm. don't worry about the, the cost of the flight. That that would be a dream to me. You know, if, if I was worth, you know, 10 million plus, I would absolutely be like, you know what? you're a good friend, you're my sister, you're my parents, you know, I'm going to fly you out business class to, you know, to wherever we're going to Paris or to Thailand, or whatever it is. I'm going to put all of us up at a really, really nice hotel with great service. Don't even, don't even bring your credit card guys, you know, dinner's all, you know, the food, dinner, everything's on me. Um, I just want everyone to have a good time. This is in years that the market's up 10 or 20%, but in years that there's a correction, <laughs> you're like skipping the family vacation. <laughs> Motel six well, I mean, time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th that is the hard part, right? Where, you know, when things are going down and you you see your net worth going down, it's it's hard to, you know, to, to watch it go down no matter what it is. You know, whether you have a thousand dollars, a million dollars or ten million dollars or even a hundred million, you don't want to go to nine point nine because it just sound it just feels like you're losing out. But maybe that's when I would, uh, you know, buy the, the paperback of Die With Zero and really take that to heart. All right. Bill billionaire or 10x. Uh, I'll be boring. I would do exactly my lifestyle would be exactly the same as now i'm already in the process of downsizing kind of ac across the board one thing i try to ask myself every day and i have it written like i don't know if you guys can see you see that mm -hmm. yeah, you can on the, the post notes yeah. just looking at those post-it notes as you were about to say that it's something weird those are five like, post-it <laughs> notes back there just like personal notes to myself that are all about like being present and you know giving to other people and things like this but one thing i try to ask myself every morning is how much time will you spend today being present, unrushed? And there's a Thai word called sabai, which Johnny knows. It's like mm. chill, happy, just like in, in in a good mood, right? I try to live my day like that. Like as soon as I have a couple of things back to back, I'm like, no, I can't, you know, cancel one. I, I like having like one thing or two things I need to do and not having to go around. I don't really enjoy traveling. But man, I like I, my, my days, the quality of my mind is just so much better than it was a couple of years ago that I don't need any of the, don't feel the need to, to have the external stuff as much. 
So I would definitely stay on this path. I would put all the money into a trust and I would have that invested, not invested, but given across three pillars, one earth, two animals, three people. The people one would be primarily around building meditation retreats, meditation centers, places where people can just go and feel like chill, get quiet, have peace of mind. The earth and animals one, I haven't given that as much thought, but you know, I wouldn't get a private jet. I wouldn't even start flying private. I don't like small planes. <laughs> I just fly like, you know, <laughs> business class when I need to. And uh, just keep doing what I'm doing, man. I think there's been so many learnings over the last couple of years, but one of them is definitely that like, for me, there's almost a negative correlation in how much I spend and the quality of my mind. Because the more you spend, the more you do, the more activities going on in your mind, the more activities going on in your mind, the less present and at peace your mind is. So I try to just do less, spend less and kill more. Not as good as, not as cool as Johnny's military, but <laughs> <laughs> two sides of the spectrum. Yeah. I, I'm sure you'll talk more about that in episode 302. So if you guys haven't somehow subscribed to the, to the podcast yet, make sure you do so. Make sure you guys share with, you know, with your friends and family, help us grow because we've, we've, we have an amazing base of subscribers and followers, but I think it's been pretty stagnant for a while. Uh, so if you would like to see episode 400, uh, in a, in a year or two, definitely help us, please help us grow. Uh, you can join as a Patreon if you haven't yet. If you've gotten at least five dollars worth of value from these last three hundred episodes, please join us uh, on Patreon and help help us grow there. Um, thank you to everybody who has been supporting so far, and I think we're gonna jump into the one hour special. I know this has been an hour in public, but this is episode three hundred, so we got to make it big. But if you join us as a Patreon for as little as five bucks, you'll have access to the video recording and the next hour of this podcast. We're going to deep dive into all things financial. We're going to open about books and we're going to answer all your questions there. Yeah. And guys, just a quick add on to what Johnny said about Patreon. It's way more than just this episode. You know, the public podcast, we usually do two a month. But that's pretty much it that we do publicly. In Patreon, I think we have more than like 400 or 500 posts in there. So pretty much all the investment chat, all the activity, 95% of the content is all on Patreon. Um, so we look forward to hopefully seeing you guys there. Yes. Thank you, bosses. We really appreciate you. Even if you aren't on Patreon, maybe uh, we could sway you to check that out or at least sign up for one month and see if you like it. We're going to jump over to our Patreon exclusive. Uh, Sam's got a lot of video presentations. I know Johnny and myself got some stuff to show as well. And we're going to dive deeper into our financials. And once again, you got to be a Patreon member to do that. So head over to investlikeaboss.com, click become a Patreon, and we'll see you over there. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.